Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Ye uh, Natalie Yeadon, and I'm the co-founder and CEO with Impetus Digital. If you're not familiar with Impetus, we offer numerous cutting edge, synchronous and asynchronous virtual collaboration tools and digital services for advisory boards, co-author working groups, medical education, internal meetings, corporate events, and everything in between. At Impetus, we really believe that all new great ideas start with a conversation. Our online collaboration platform is the perfect place for not only just starting these conversations, but also for continuously building on great ideas and insights that are generated over time. And we also do this by creating authentic relationships with the part participants in the process. So having these big, audacious, courageous conversations is how we can start to implement change and to positively disrupt healthcare together. So with all of that said, the idea behind this webinar series is to start the conversation around some of these big, you know, controversial thoughts, working with the provocateurs, the thought leaders, the idea generators, the digital entrepreneurs, to discuss the opportunities and issues that the healthcare industry is facing, along with how technology can help. So I'm really, really thrilled to have one of these thought leaders. Um, this is actually Dr. Owen Muir. He's a University of Rochester trained adult and child psychiatrist with several years of clinical experience. He is the co-founder and the chief innovation officer of Brooklyn Minds. This is actually a team-based tech-enabled comprehensive mental health practice that offers, offers, offers services for individuals and families across the lifespan. And under his supervision and leadership, Brooklyn Minds has become one of the largest outpatient mentalization-based treatment, or what they call MBT, practices for adults, children, and families in the US. And among other responsibilities, he also oversees Brooklyn Minds' groundbreaking deep transcranial magnetic stimulation, or DTMS program. We're gonna learn all about that today. In addition, Owen is also working on two podcasts, one is called Remotely Possible, which looks at anxiety and despair through a mental health lens, as well as Pandemic Check-In, which takes a look at mental health during COVID-19. Welcome, Owen. So great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I actually did a, start a third podcast recently, which is not a big undertaking. It's called Stories for My Children. And I realized if I'm on the internet, anything I read to them is more relevant. So it's me reading kind of classic stories that my kids can listen to on, on YouTube because that's where everything relevant in their life is. I love it. And what a great idea. So good for you. So three podcasts if you're not busy enough. So Owen, um, you obviously, you know, starting some really important and like timely things here today. Tell us a little bit, you know, you're an MD. Tell us a little bit about the career trajectory that you took to land where you are today with Brooklyn Mines. Yeah, so I, it it didn't start with medicine. Um, it actually started at Sony Music Studios in uh, when I was about twenty odd years old, twenty twenty one. Um, no, nineteen. I did my internship there, and then kind of went back. So I was an assistant engineer uh, back in the day at what was the most expensive bomb shelter in New York, working midnight to eight, or whenever they paged me in for because I had a minimum wage job with a pager. And, uh, you know, helping, you know, Beyonce feel as comfortable as possible and making sure all <laughs> the uh, things were set up as, just as she liked it or, or Swizz Beats, et cetera. I, I was uh, very much in a service role um, for, for the people making, you know, music, TV shows, et cetera. And, you know, I learned a ton. Um, but one of the things I learned is that uh, staying up all night is not the best idea for humans. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to do something l less punitive and I chose medicine. Um, <laughs> uh, some people may be listening to that and wondering if that was a facetious comment because some people may think no, otherwise. No, the music, the music industry is brutal. Um, and, and probably even worse now, being, being a musician, I, you know, my mother runs an arts nonprofit and I worked for, for her for about 10 years. Um, 
so I learned, you know, grant writing, et cetera. And I got to take this really kind of broad look at what businesses are run like uh, before I was a physician and then kind of stumbled into being someone who's running a business. Um, and, and what happened is after, after my tenure at, at, at Sony was up and they really, you know, they, they work you really hard, they pay you very little. And uh, being a musician or an artist is just something where, you know, uh, you're working for it all day, every day with no kind of guarantee of success. This is a doctor, you know, you're going to have a job more or less um, that's going to, you know, pay you enough to eat. And that's not true for, for musicians and for, for producers and engineers and, and the like. So um, honestly, it's less stressful um, being a physician on, on average, at least from a like deep uncertainty about your life, unless you become an entrepreneur. And then you get to relive all that stuff all over again. Um, so, you know, it, it was a progression. And I think, uh, you know, learning what I did about kind of, you know, promptness, uh, what matters in the music industry, what determines if you succeed or not, is if you show up on time early every day. And, you know, I carried that, you know, through medicine. I was never late to rounds. I was never late to, you know, generally never late to appointments. Um, and when you're there, you have to be able to deliver. And I think a lot of the improvisation I learned in music has strongly influenced my my day-to-day -day work as a psychiatrist as an, and as an entrepreneur. Beautiful, love it. So when you went into medicine, did you know that the entrepreneurial world was what was going to happen for you? Were you in practice for no. a while? Like, how did Brooklyn Mines uh, basically start yeah. to have its beginnings? So um, it had its beginnings. Uh, I, I met my wife, um, who is our CEO, uh, at the child psychiatry annual meeting when I was a resident physician and she was a fellow at MGH in Disney World. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I rarely do you meet someone and just kind of immediately know this is a person I have to stay connected with. Um, and more rarely does that person turn out to not only be uh, a tremendous partner in life, but also kind of the other half of your brain you needed to do the work that you end up doing together. And that's what happened with Carlene McMillan. Uh, she is uh, a tremendous psychiatrist, but also organizationally um, has a very, every detail she has command over, every use case. It's it's like, you know, she, she tripped out of the Harvard CS classroom into medicine somehow, or vice versa, actually, she's taking CS now. Um, but the ability for her to think in that really structured way and to allow me to have more kind of like, well, here's a big idea. Let's vet it and figure out where all the problems are and make it actually actionable. Um, that's that's what happened when when I met uh, Carlene. And yet still, we didn't know. I thought I was going to be a schizophrenia researcher when I met her. Um, she had other plans. Uh, she trained at McLean. I trained at Northwell and then Bellevue. And what, what ended up happening was she, she was working at, at, at in the Harvard system with severe personality disorders, uh, borderline personality disorder, and, and, and others, narcissistic personality disorder, et cetera. And, and I thought, you know, all that was hogwash. Therapy was something I hated. And I'm going to do research on long-acting injectable antipsychotics. Um, and she's like, you might be good with these patients. And so eventually I ended up going to do the mentalization-based treatment training at, at, offered through the Anna Freud Center at McLean. And my life was changed in a, in a weekend. Awesome. So I guess the, the idea around Brooklyn Minds is it's technically an online um, community of sorts. Uh, there, there was obviously the world of Brooklyn Minds before COVID mm -hmm. and there's Brooklyn Minds post COVID. Yep. What was Brooklyn Mines before, and did the pandemic transform its mandate objectives, or you know what it is today? So the transformation it started as a medical practice. It started as uh, my first day of fellowship. Uh, I had a full night of fully booked uh, outpatient mental health care as a psychiatrist. Uh, the, <laughs> right. So I started the business, uh, you know, on the side, as it were. Um, I was I did four years of adult training and then you're an adult attending 
and then child psychiatry fellowship is thereafter. And so just, you know, um, on the side, I started seeing patients in private practice. And that's how Brooklyn Mind started. Carlene was working at NYU also. Uh, and when she left NYU, after we had our twin children, which we have, uh, hi, Trent and Quinn, when you watch this someday, um, it, she, she decided to join me in private practice. And that's that was the beginning of Brooklyn Minds. Um, we were joking one night, uh, you know, around midnight in bed, just saying, we can call it Brooklyn Minds Magnets and Mentalization. And she's like, actually, Brooklyn Minds is pretty good. And I think that's kind of the, the key kind of the interaction. Like, I have some stupid idea, and she makes it a good one. I love um, it. And so what, what makes your practice, so tell me a little bit about how COVID impacted it. And also, yeah. I think what everybody's probably wondering is, like, how is your practice different from other psychiatry or mental health clinics or really like things that are actually on on the web today yep and, and so there are a couple kind of key moments the i think the first key moment was we were seeing patients who were too complex to manage alone and so we realized we very quickly had to start hiring other people to come work with us because we needed a team for the kind of patients we were managing um the the, the second key element was uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation becoming part of our practice. Um, once you have one of those machines, the economics of everything you do change. And it requires interaction with systems, which, you know, private pay outpatient psychiatrists, they have no idea how insurance works. I certainly didn't. Uh, even at NYU, they had no idea how insurance worked. They just, you know, cranked out the same bill every time. And, uh, you know, sucks for you that you have to pay out of pocket for it. Um, but we very quickly realized these, this is a wildly effective treatment that's way too much money out of pocket. We're going to have to deal with insurance. And so we started unraveling that system's knot. And, and the third key moment was meeting Mike Sarmiento, um, who uh, is the former uh, you know, scaler in chief, as it were, for One Medical um, over brunch. His, his wife runs uh, Urban Chalet, which is the design firm we had retained to do our office. And he took a look at what we we're doing. He said, you got to scale this. <laughs> um, and and he, he was right. Um, so he went very quickly from being a consultant to being an employee. Uh, we brought on a chief technical officer and we you know, started functioning as a startup, not just uh, a medical practice, you know, and building out the infrastructure to scale so that when COVID hit, a week before anyone else, uh, you know, we recognized A, the danger, uh, and B, we had the infrastructure to be able to, on a dime, uh, you know, everything went, in, you know, digital that needed to, and everything that had to stay in person did. So I think the difference between Brooklyn Mines is that, A, we had this infrastructure. We have like 70 employees. Most practices are one person, maybe one person and an administrator. Um, maybe a small group, but this kind of scale that takes insurance and does interventional care. So for example, uh, Spravato, S-ketamine is something we were the first practice in New York to be able to deploy. Um, and now we have, you know, 30 visits a week um, and increasing. Um, psychedelics are coming online and we're involved in that, in that process as well from both a drug development and kind of training standpoint. And we also offer comprehensive psychotherapy. So it's not just, you know, the doctor and you get a prescription and it's done. We have group therapy, we have individual therapy, and we have ongoing supervision. And all those things translated just effortlessly to, uh, thanks, you know, to having a strong IT department, uh, to the cloud <laughs> when we needed it to most. Yeah. And, uh, and so our patients have been cared for ever since. Beautiful. What a what an amazing story. Just being at the right place at the right time and just having it all unfold just when it happened. And these are some of the stories that I like to call as being the silver lining of something that was a confluence of disasters. And so we see these like little saplings coming out as these new sprouts of opportunity. So there's so many things that you brought up there, and I kind of want to tease and linger on a few of these items. And the first one that you know is kind of a new concept for many people listening is something called mentalization-based treatment. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard a lot about you know, things like cognitive behavioral therapy and other sorts of things, but how do, the, how do those fit in, if at all, with this idea of mentalization-based treatments? Uh, so um, if I got any royalties whatsoever on my book, I'd really plug it right now because there's a whole chapter Carlene wrote on that. Um, uh, you know, 
mentalization based treatment is a manualized psychotherapy. And I'll start with what's important about it. Uh, it plays well with others. And when you look at effect size, which is a measurement in medicine of how potent something is, not whether it's different from placebo, which is statistical significance, but how big of a difference does it make? So if you compare uh, a small effect size to something like 0.2, uh, that's Abilify augmentation and depression. Uh, a modest effect size would be 0.5, that's you know, Prozac for OCD. Uh, a large effect size is 0.7, that's lithium and bipolar disorder. And a really big one is something like Adderall and ADHD at 0.9. The units are standard deviations. Mentalization-based treatment for acute suicidality uh, has an effect size of 1.26. And so as a psychotherapy, it's a more potent intervention than almost any treatment for any condition in all of psychiatry. So it's better than every pill I have. And so before you even care what it is, the fact that it's better than everything else for suicidality, which is something we don't have good biological interventions for, at least didn't, now we're starting to have some, um, that, that sold it to me. Now it turns out what it is, is it's a way to manualize dynamic psychotherapy that works not just for individuals, but for teams and systems. And that's something we call AMBIT, uh, Adaptive Mentalization Based Integrative Treatment. The, the fundamental idea is curiosity, right? And that um, being in a curious state, wondering you know, what's in your mind and someone else's mind at the same time. I see you you're nodding right now. So it seems like you're engaged. I'm kind of working that out in my mind. For some people that goes offline, you get too hot, you know, and, and that's adaptive. You don't want to wonder if a tiger is hungry when it's coming to eat you, you want to run away. Jumping to conclusions in some contexts is a good idea. Uh, there are some situations where you don't want to care deeply about the internal states of people. Try doing that walking down the street in New York and just wondering what's going on inside the mind of everyone you see. You'll be exhausted. <laughs> and so mentalization-based treatment took that idea that, that was developed out of the uh, attachment work of John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth and Peter Fonagy, um, who himself got treatment at the Anna Freud Center when he was a kid and now is their CEO, uh, took this work, turned it into an empirical evidence base. And with his colleague, Anthony Bateman, a psychiatrist, uh, Peter is a child psychologist. They turned this into a manualized psychotherapy. So, you know, just like there's a manual for CBT for anxiety, there's a manual for MBT. And the manual for adolescent suicide and self-injury I wrote with colleagues, including Laurel Williams and others. So in some ways, it's kind of like a rating and ranking system at which you know, knowing which sorts of treatments or methodologies. To explain a little bit about the, what the concept of manualization means. Sure. Um, manualization is, uh, I think uh, there's a two, two parts, manualization and branding. <laughs> um, you want the public to know uh, that something is a thing, right? And you want them to know if you have a thing that it's good. And drug companies get this because instead of calling their drug vorioxetine, they come up with Trentilex or Abilify for aripiprazole, and they sell it endlessly, right? So you wanna have good branding for anything, and therapy branding is all three-letter acronyms. <laughs> that's, that's the key, is having three letters. Thank you, Aaron Beck and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. It's pithy, CBT, people get it, iterations thereof, DBT, you know, IPSRT, it has five letters, that means it's totally revolutionary. Um, but <laughs> having a, a manual says, when we study this therapy, People are doing it in a way that's replicable. Okay. And we know that because we have adherence scales so that when we look at a video of someone doing the therapy, we can say, this is the therapy we say it is, or it's not. And then when you look at the outcomes, is the therapy delivered the way we say it's supposed to be delivered? Does that get that 1.26 outcome? And the answer is, in this case, yes. So writing a manual for something is just writing down how you do something in a way that people can reliably replicate. And that makes it possible for more people who haven't met you uh, and been taught directly by you to pick something up. Um, and it makes it possible for, for you to have a, a, a good brand. Uh, I think MBT has failed a bit on the branding front because the, even the word itself is uh, distressingly British um, and a little bit unapproachable. Um, and the creators will agree with that because they, they, they came up with it in a certain context they were basically trying to explain these approaches to psychoanalysts and language that's confusing is appealing to them. 
this is very, very interesting because obviously the whole science behind <clears throat> psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and anything with this is a very subjective world. We all live in our own heads. And how do we, outside of, you know, adding silicone diodes on, on our cerebrum and downloading and, or uploading our thoughts, and okay. maybe one day that might happen and that might be part of your practice. You guys can scale that, um, right? You'll be working with Elon right. Musk in the Neuralink. But in the meantime, this is all very subjective science. So when you talk about manualization, so I would argue, I would argue it's it's less subjective in psychotherapy, especially for conditions like borderline personality disorder, than it is in medication for depression. And I'll tell you why. If you look at heart attacks, right? They happen or they don't. <laughs> a stroke. There was a stroke or there was no stroke. And in neurology and cardi cardiology, they have large studies where they study endpoints that are not debatable, more or less. Depression studies, for years, we have satisfied ourselves with 50% better according to what people say on a rating scale that is pretty subjective. Like, do you feel better? Well, here are the things we do. We systematize it. In borderline personality disorder, there are suicide attempts to count. There are hospitalizations to count, and there are a lot of them. And so having those hard endpoints is what lets us do powerful research, I would argue. And one of the reasons I like researching conditions that are difficult to treat is because you have very low placebo response rates and you have hard endpoints. So I know there are less suicide attempts in patients who have received mentalization-based treatment in an on-model fashion. And that is numerically less. Now I see subjectively their lives are different, et cetera. There are reasons for that. They're deep and intrapsychic and important. But you know, you go to the hospital less. That's what built our business. Mm -hmm. Being able to demonstrate reduced rates of hospitalization, which we have reduced 98% in a cohort who are very high utilizers to begin with. That's what got us in network with insurance at rates that were reasonable. That's what got us our value-based care arrangement with Optum. And that's what launched my other company, Sphere, which is bringing the kind of care model we have in an insurance product, essentially, to uh, employer groups. Because we had the data to say, this work that we do reduces something you can measure in dollars, in uh, hospitalizations, in health outcomes that are hard endpoints. So empiricism matters, uh, and it's not, it's squishy science I'm not a big fan of. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, I think that was brilliantly said, and thank you, and I think that was a really great reframe for me. As I was mentioning earlier, I mean, part of this mentalization-based treatment, we've heard of things in the traditional the cognitive behavioral therapy, but there, since there, there's other sorts of therapies as well, dialectical, acceptance-based, um, something called interpersonal social rhythms therapy. IPSRT, what, it's got all five letters. What are some of these cool things that people need to know? Yeah. What, what is going on in, in this new world of, of, of behavioral and uh, psychiatric medicine? So I think what's new in the way Brooklyn Minds does it is, you know, we start with a really comprehensive triage. We assign patients based on having substantial amounts of information beforehand to clinicians we feel are going to be right. And then once we have an accurate diagnosis, we have, um, because we spend more time figuring it out, uh, our intakes uh, are on average two hours if they need to be or longer. I've done one that was six hours because wow. if you don't know the diagnosis, you can't prescribe the treatment. And different psychotherapies are good for different things. So cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is great for anxiety. A variant uh, exposure and response prevention is remarkable for obsessive compulsive disorder, which we see all the time. And IPSRT is the only evidence-based psychotherapy for bipolar disorder, um, which I have, actually. And that's how I found out about TMS. I got treated with it. And so when you have an accurate assessment, and you have access to all the treatments. And we realized since the first line interventions, especially in children, are psychotherapies, not medications, in almost every condition, except for ADHD, we want to have all that available. And so we have tons of therapists who are subspecialists at whatever may come. So when someone has more than one problem, we can combine these things in ways that make sense. But it's like choosing an antibiotic. You, you, know, you look at the, what, what are you treating? Well, it's pseudomonas, and that response to XYZ 
actually we can look under the microscope and say, okay, this you know is sensitive to uh, piperacillin, tazomycin, uh, and and that's the antibiotic we're going to use. Or actually, we're going to need to use something for vancomycin, you know, for MRSA or whatever it is. You tailor the antibiotic to the infection, and we tailor the treatment to the underlying understanding, which is shared with the patients. So they get something that's helpful. And then we track those outcomes. And so we have really large data sets on how our patients are doing um, that have informed uh, not just you know, payment models, but push the science forward. So for example, 25% of the data on treatment resistant OCD is from our shop. Fantastic, that's incredible for population health management and everything else, which is terrific. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about something that you're very deeply uh, successful with, probably one of the, the core people that really even created this, which is the deep transcranial magnetic stimulation process. Can you explain what that is and why you have been so wildly successful with this? Um, so deep trans transcranial magnetic stimulation is a variant of recurrent transcranial magnetic stimulation, RTMS. And uh, my, my history with this dates back to college. Uh, one of my dear friends and classmates, Allie Bickford, went to the Max Planck Institute for a year in Germany. She came back, she's like, I was doing this awesome research on TMS. I'm like, what's that? She's like, it's a big magnet. You can point it at someone's occipital cortex and you can make them see lights. Wow. So this is a technology invented in the 1980s. And frankly, is a cautionary tale about the need to have patents on things. Because Ted Barker, who is still alive, everyone who invented anything in TMS is more or less still alive, and you can meet them at the Clinical TMS Society Conference, which is kind of awesome. Everyone's there to tell the tale. And so Ted invented this treatment that you know we first figured out could make muscles move, but you have a magnetic field. And we have, uh, I mean, literally a right hand rule from physics class, thumb in the direction of the wire, fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field, current induced in the wire. I was an MCAT teacher. Uh, we have these <laughs> wires in our brain and those wires are axons. There are nerves projections and they're insulated by what's called myelin, which is uh, you know insulation for all well it's worth and electrical current goes from one place to another. Right? And so it turns out a changing magnetic field recurrent in a pattern can change how those neurons fire. And what's even cooler is you can target it to different parts of the brain and the patterns of stimulation you use can change whether the neurons fire more or less in a certain area of the brain. And when you combine that understanding with functional neuroimaging, you're able to understand, well, we're actually targeting the node in a functional connectivity network. So turning up the firing here can turn down the firing over here, X, Y, Z. So you have this whole kind of like uh, if you remember Nintendo games, up, down, up, down, left, right, start, stop, start, start, right, the cheat code. Um, depression, the, the surgery for depression, deep brain stimulation or DBS required putting these electrodes really deep into the brain into a, a structure we call the uh, subthalamic nucleus. Um, and I'm sorry, that's in Parkinson's disease. Uh, it's the uh, um, subgenual cingulate. And that's a surgery. <laughs> Right? You don't want to do that all the time. But many, many people have treatment resistant depression. The first medication you try for depression has a 30% chance of getting you to remission. The next drug, 10%. The next drug, 10%. The next drug, 10%. Two years later of misery, side effects, and suffering, you have a 50% chance of your depression being over. Taking what we understand from fMRI combining it with transcranial magnetic stimulation and the deep TMS technology by the Brainsway company, who we've worked very closely with, um, means the targeting is less wonky. So we don't actually have to scan people in advance. We leave that to the people in the lab at Stanford. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for your work. Um, and essentially we're able to treat depression, OCD, and now smoking cessation uh, is coming to market um, with a non-invasive treatment that stimulates parts of the brain. So their firing patterns change in a way that's sustained, but not permanent. And the remission rates in this, when you use accelerated protocols, um, which means, and this is true, in five days of treatment, you can have someone with acute and chronic suicidality 
and depression who's failed 13 medication trials on average and even electroconvulsive therapy as well in remission in five days, 80% of the time. Phenomenal. That is very, very cool. Yeah. I mean, that's out of this world, which isn't great. It's out, it's out of this world. It doesn't sound real. It, it is, it turns out. But and I'm just kind of curious on that note again, one of the other areas that you really excelled at being at the leading edge of is the use of psychedelics. Um, I'm a big t Tim Ferriss fan. I'm sure, you know, lots of people around here listen to him and he's a, a huge proponent and investor in all kinds of things. Um, um, ayahuasca and uh, other sorts of medications. I know you were talking about something called Spravato. Um, where, I mean, and, and then you have like large swaths of the population who are very much of like, keep this away. And this is detrimental to society. And how can we possibly be considering the use of psychedelics to be, you know, it, you know, how do we prevent these people from becoming addicts and all sorts of other things? So how do you speak mm -hmm. to that naysayer audience and what, um, what endpoints are you using to counter those arguments? Sure. Um, Big Pharma gave up on CNS drug development more or less years ago because they had interventions that, um, to quote a colleague who used to work at Pfizer, psychiatry abdicated its responsibility to cure anything. We made 50% better our God and we worshiped it for 30 years. And then we, made psychotherapy be measured by the same stick. So cognitive behavioral therapy is just as effective as Prozac, which gets people 50% better. That doesn't mean your depression is over. And when you have small effect sizes, it takes a lot of participants to differentiate between placebo and active agent. The Trintelex trial, Vorioxetine, which I mentioned before, which has an approval for treatment-resistant depression, has over 2,000 patients in it to show a 3.5% difference between that and placebo. That's science, but it's not inspiring and it's not an 80% remission rate in five days. Um, the Brainsway study for treatment resistant OCD had 99 patients to get FDA cleared because that's how potent it is with an effect size of about 1.3 we were able to show. So things that work matter. Uh, and I am, all, you know, when I hear, I don't want these people to become addicts. Well, I say, first off, these people is us. Um, you know, my, my sister died on the floor of, you know, an overdose probably um, combined with a history of mental illness. These drugs have been killing us before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and will continue to kill us after it. So the addictions are here and they're killing people every day. It's not LSD that's doing that. <laughs> Um, by and large, these are drugs that were developed in laboratories um, or, you know, grown in nature and been used for centuries. So we have a lot of safety data, um, but I'm not a shaman. Uh, I am, you know, I'm pro-legalization and I think the war on drugs kills people, but that's a public health stance. As a doctor, what I care about is, is this thing able to demonstrate efficacy in relieving suffering from well-defined diseases in a randomized control trial? You know, getting approval through the FDA is something that it's kind of hard to argue with. I'm not, I'm not advocating as a physician for, uh, you know, people, I, you know, I'm a libertarian at heart. So if people want to use substances, I don't think they should go to jail. But the medical use of psychedelics isn't something I'm particularly interested in willy nilly. I'm interested in, you know, I want to be able to have the same answers for psychedelics that I do for TMS, that I do for those medications, that I do for psychotherapy. But yeah. what's important is if you look at the first MAPS trial for MDMA uh, assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, the effect size is 0.9. And we have almost nothing for PTSD in the realm of medications. The Cochrane Review had Effexor as the only thing that was any better than placebo and only by a little bit. And we have prazosin for nightmares and that's about it. So we need more interventions. These are things that show tremendous promise. And if they can pass the same muster as any other drug and, and even more, their risk, uh, risk evaluation and mitigation strategies that you have to follow. So Spravato, which I mentioned is S-ketamine. 
It's an intranasal formulation of the thing we've been using in anesthesia forever. And it treats severe suicidal depression within hours to days, not weeks to months. And to do it, it has to be done at a physician's office under supervision, monitoring. This is not people going and getting high. That's their business. This is helping people overcome severe crippling illnesses, which includes addiction. For so sure. that's my ugh to that. Yes. And it's a big topic. It's a whole other conversation yeah. on its own as well. Yeah. So Owen, so um we're we're really talking about being in a in a world that really got turned upside down and it's kind of still tumbling down the hill, right? And we're we're gonna be in this for a while and there's still lots of repercussions. Certainly one of the things that I am really going to be intrigued by in the next several years is some of the deeper research that's going to be had on the mental health of each and every one of us through what we've actually just gone through in the past year and the years to come. Can you tell us a little bit around what you have seen happening to some of the more traditional diagnoses of, you know, and I wouldn't say traditional, but the things that we've seen around people who've been experiencing things like psychosis, or you were mentioning earlier, suicidality, and even addictions. Have mm -hmm. we seen, or can you draw some immediate conclusions or just some assumptions of what you might think might be what might be the impact of this pandemic on some of these sorts of things? The major fallout from the pandemic is, is and will continue to be uh, psychiatric illness and suffering for years to decades to come that we are woefully underprepared to handle. It's already killing more people from overdose. 11% uh, of Americans, I think in July, were thinking about suicide. Um, and you know we don't have a system that responds to people's needs meaningfully, and we don't have a system that anyone can afford. And that's our fault. We legislated that into existence. So are um, you suggesting that maybe COVID has been an accelerant of something that was boiling in the back end for a while and it was just an inevitability that this was going to implode? The data, the data strongly supports that. So, you know, before the pandemic, the number one leading cause of death among young people was overdose and suicide. And it continues to be overdose and suicide. We're in a really interesting predicament. I know a lot of people and I've been in the pharmaceutical industry and working with pharmaceutical clients for years and years and years. And one of the other things that you keep hearing about is issues around the, the reduced diagnosis of cancer patients and rare, can rare disease uh, patients. And because all eyes have been on the pandemic and vaccines and rapid testing, the same thing is probably gonna be declared about mental health. With all of these diseases and conditions just amplifying in terms of intensity and immensity, how are we going to manage all of this? I, I, you know, you know, I know you earlier said that we're now tapping into insurance companies and what have you, but are we going to be sort of like, is there going to be further implosions around people walking away and say, we can't afford treating, you know, this, are we going to be turning our backs on some of these patients? And are we eventually going to be in a place of triaging that we don't want to find ourselves in? Don't, uh, going to be turning our backs, uh, we, we've, we've been doing it for years. I'll ask you, if you were suicidal, what would you do tonight? Call, call a suicide. All right, call somebody. I, it's hard to ask that because you don't know what is in the mind of somebody who's suicidal. I don't. My, I don't. My, my sane way would be, I'd be calling my family, friends, whatever, mm -hmm. to talk me out of it. But I don't think yeah. that I would be in that if I was actually in a suicide mode. And, and, and importantly, when I've asked this to like Wall Street Journal reporters who are asking about the mental health crisis, but like practically, what would you personally do? They don't know who they call. Maybe they call a suicide hotline. Maybe they'd call 911. It's not clear what they do. And how would you find a doctor? How, how do you know I who's a good psychiatrist? How would I find a doctor? Yeah. I mean, if you I'm, would go to one, you'd probably eventually be referred to one. Right. A family Correct. doctor or referral or something mm -hmm. like that or yeah yep and how much would you expect to pay for for a visit i don't know anywhere from two to five hundred dollars a visit um the intake for child psychiatry in new york at some of our leading centers is well over two thousand mm. dollars 
for the initial appointment for your child. And they don't take insurance. And that's in the city with a thousand of the world's 6,000 child psychiatrists. Right. For adults, it's not much better. And how do you even know if they're any good? Like surgeons have outcomes, et cetera. So even just the basic question of what do I do is something most people aren't equipped to answer. And that's a problem because that's something you should know, right? If you need help, you should be able to get help. And the fact that the most basic kind of help, wine club meets its members needs, right? If you want wine, it will deliver the kind of wine you want. And many people use that to cope. Netflix, on-demand coping. Um, you know, if the, if the, the Win, Windsor Dynasty is gonna do it for you or Madam Secretary, it'll be there for you. There's no analog for mental health care. We have a bunch of lone rangers who are operating in low capital environments that haven't engaged with industry, that haven't engaged with insurance payment models because there's no reason to. They can make hundreds of dollars you know, not doing that and make a fraction of it working with systems. It's, it's insanity. Absolutely. We are not valuing the thing. And so I think, you know, first the incentives have to align. You have to have, you know, care that is accessible, understandable, and there's got to be a bridge of trust to that help. Because one thing we've learned in the past year is that we don't trust for good reasons. Yeah, absolutely. And there's just, honestly, this is, I'm sure this is why you have a podcast because there's millions and millions of hours of top topic discussions just right here. It's hard to linger on anything for a substantial time because I want to cover so much. But, you know, one of the other things that's surfaced in this time of social contagion is also all of the social unrest that's happened. And probably the yes. impact of all of the political upheaval and economic um, discourse and issues. Uh, we're seeing a lot around the, um, the uh, social injustice and in inequalities. We've seen a lot from the Black Lives Matter. We've also seen a lot of issues around um, you know, comf being comfortable with one's own sexuality, inclusion, diversity. How is this confluence or this big tornado of stuff all kind of landed at your doorstep and you know what's shown up and how is your clinic handling it? So one of the things that that we had we've had you know we're very lucky is we work with our local community when we were hiring people to work here and that meant having people who are sex positive who were informed about uh, you know gender identity for a long time I was the only like nominally straight white guy in the office um, <laughs> And, you know, we had a pretty diverse workforce to begin with. And it turns out that matters a lot. And it matters, I think, more for therapy than perhaps psychiatry. But frankly, like just looking at me, there are plenty of people who aren't going to trust me. And for good reason. Building those bridges of trust to people who can be helpful, scaffolding those relationships matters. So we have, for example, you know, technology mind strongest developing to identify using massive data sets who's in crisis. You know who knows if you're in crisis? Everyone you work with in your entire family, <laughs> right? It's not a secret. Um, people who are suffering, you know, some suffer in silence, but many do not. Um, if you've ever had a breakup and someone said, ah, now I'm gonna kill myself, right? That's someone who's suffering. And so what we did to, to handle that is when, when a, a major international media company approached us when George Floyd was murdered and said, help us support our black employees, we said yes. And so we took the, the, the therapists we had who are experts in that domain in multiculturalism. You know, there are not a lot, a lot of black therapists out there, but you know, it had always been a priority for us to have a diverse workforce because it's crucial to what we do to have a lot of options that people can build trust with one way or the other. And that means not just what you look like, but you know the kind of cultural experiences you've had, your personal style, et cetera. You need to have options so people can find the click, the fit, the trust to actually engage in, in help that's relevant, not just interesting. Because otherwise it's like taking a class on therapy and not having it be therapeutic. And so for that client, we put together a, a program where we had culturally competent coaching available 
you can go onto our website with Sphere. You can select a coach you want to talk to. There's a brief bio. You know what they look like. There's a picture. And maybe you're non-binary and want to talk to someone who's non-binary, and we have that set up. Right. And that's a really low bar to entry. And then if that person who happens to be one of our team members recognizes, you know, in the triage process, working with them in a coaching context, they need referral to medical care, they can refer you to Brooklyn Minds is in network with that company's insurance. And so building that bridge of really easy to access help, getting all the way to expertise, that's a model that we think is really replicable and scalable. And that's why we created this, this Sphere company to bring that model, not just to the company who came to us and asked us to do it. Um, thank you, by the way. Um, but bring that same model of culturally competent help that builds a bridge to trust with communities that don't. Talking about trust, I mean, I've been laying kind of the foundation of what is already self-explanatory to everybody who's been living through this in the last year, that there's almost like this low level insidious amount of anxiety that is residing in probably every person, including the ones who seem to be most acclimatized and who seem to be absolutely fine and have kind of managed through everything just perfectly. Is there going to be a new diagnosis or a new observation about this level of anxiety, the effects it's having on people's sleep, um, emotional capacity, productivity, relationships with family? Is there something that we're gonna be uncovering through this, a new type of diagnosis? And what is this going to look like in the future? Um, I think like, so the diagnostic manual I have in my office is an art project version that one of my patients made. It, he called it the DSM-5 exhaustive edition. <laughs> um, and it's, it's major depressive disorder. Uh, when you take the criteria for major depressive disorder, you can combine them 764 different ways. And so it's an eight volume set actually, <laughs> all the size and layout of the DSM. Um, that's just major depressive disorder. There is an arbitrariness to how we've decided to categorize things. And I think diagnosis is as helpful as it's helpful and not when it's not. And so to the degree that a diagnosis can help us understand, I think it's really useful. To the degree that it feels like a label or a bludgeon or a tool of you know, enforcing racial hierarchy like antisocial personality disorder often is, for example, or conduct disorder, um, oppositional defiant disorder. We have uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. We've got plenty of politically very weighted diagnoses. Schizoaffective disorder. If you're black, you're vastly more likely to be diagnosed with that than bipolar disorder if you're white, with relatively speaking the same symptoms. And different care gets doled out differently through different insurance coverage standards for those different diagnoses. And once diagnosis is driving reimbursement, once it's driving anything other than understanding and care, I think we're in the wrong place. Yeah. We're, so, um... it, well, I think a diagnosis has to evolve, but the first step in that evolution is some humility around what diagnosis is and what it isn't, how it got there, and how it can be helpful or not. Because if it's not helpful, it's not helpful. Yeah, very true, very, very true. As we, as we sort of transform into this new tech, technological world, this revolution that's unfolding in front of all of us, and certainly it's affected Brooklyn Minds because you're now incorporating telehealth and, and all these sorts of things online as well. So there's been some advantages is what sort of technological innovations, as we start to think about the standard ways we've been treated, we've been using mentalization methods, we've been using chemical methods through pharmaceutical companies, and potentially, obviously, the combination of both. Are we going to start looking at things like apps, technologies, software as a medical device? What do you sort of foresee as being the next evolution of treatment and management of people with mental um, conditions? Well, we already are. So uh, Nightwear is a company that's produced and the first digital therapeutic for mental health that's FDA cleared. It's an Apple Watch with an app that wakes you up from your nightmares if you have PTSD. And we have companies like MindMed in the space who is, you know, they started as a psychedelic drug development company and now they're bringing online uh, their, you know, digital health division. Um, and uh, 
the the team they're bringing on for that is one you know who I, I actually know some of the people on having better measurement and better tools matters. There are plenty of things we're not doing in psychiatry that we do in every other field of medicine and every other field of human endeavor, right? <laughs> Go on Instagram. There are machine learning algorithms deciding what to show you. Uh, there's no intelligent anything assisting me in my practice as a psychiatrist on a day-to-day -day basis to care for my patients. And there could and should be. So I think that is going to be in the hands of patients and understanding what they're doing, incentivizing pro-health behaviors in the hands of physicians to understand what they could or should do, in the hands of therapists to make the therapy more effective, and in the hands of payers to make sure we incentivize taking care of people who need it and keeping them out of hospital settings, which, by the way, increase rates of completed suicide by 212-fold. Yeah, so, very, very interesting. Are you ever going to see the day where we can take transcranial magnetic stimulation away from the big machines that one would have to go to Brooklyn Mines to participate in, to one day having something that we could put on as a skull cap or a little transmitter that we, you know, stick on the side of our forehead? Are we, are we anywhere near being able to stimulate ourselves to change our minds? Um, I think uh, yes is the answer. Near, there's a TMS device which is a single pulse device that neurologists can prescribe for migraine. So you lay, you put it on your occipital cortex, just like my colleague did at uh, Max Planck Institute, but a single transcranial magnetic stimulation pulse can abort a migraine. Wow. So the future is now, that's an at-home device. Doing the work we do here has a risk of seizure, requires skilled technicians. Um, there is a benefit to having people seen every day, but is this gonna get cheaper, faster, closer to home, more effective? Yeah. Absolutely. Why would you? It? Why, right now we talk a lot a bit about the mix because of the, the distancing and you know the, the lockdown procedures and all those requirements. So you've kind of probably been able to mix and match what's being done in person versus what can be done successfully through telehealth and other sorts of mechanisms digitally. Um, tell us a little bit about the in-home or community care. I think what you're calling the Winnicott program. Yeah. Is that being administered locally or can that be transmitted digitally? Uh, so uh, great question. Both is the answer. Um, the Winnicott program was developed by uh, Rachel Vogel and, and myself. Um, uh, she's a psychologist here and um, it's named after D.H. Winnicott, who is the uh, analyst who came up with the, the phrase, the good enough mother. Um, and wrote the kind of classic article, Hate and the Countertransference. And it's all of our coaches are trained in mentalization-based treatment. And they can go to the community. And if someone's acutely suicidal, instead of admitting them to the hospital, um, we can, you know, go get a dog. That's happened. If someone has psychosis symptoms, we can administer oral medications directly observed. We can give them long-acting injectables in person and hopefully avoiding hospitalizations in that context. Leaving families in the position of trying to keep suicidal people safe is a mistake. And I've seen that mistake end in tragedy over and over again, sadly. Yeah. Having teams who can do that, hospitalization is like two grand a day. And as I mentioned, increasing the rate of completed suicide, taking away people's autonomy, um, if you don't have to, you shouldn't. And yet there's not a payment model yet for that kind of care. And that's what we're working on with um, you know, our, our partners in, in value-based care to bring those kinds of comprehensive services, which include coaching, which we could do virtually, right? If you're helping someone with their organizational skills for the day, you can check in with them by Zoom like we're doing right now. I feel like we've had a conversation and, 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 and connected. And that's the same feeling you can have Connection is the medicine for hopelessness and desperation. Absolutely. And it doesn't just have to be a medical doctorate that's delivering that connection. It has to be someone you can relate to and who's well-trained. Beautiful, Beautiful. Be beautifully said. Now, when we actually project into the future and we think about uh, the technologies and things that's going to connect us in the future, um, feeling the companionship, feeling like you have, I mean, we've heard everything. We've sort of seen, probably seen the movie Her, We've seen, we've heard of a company called Replica where people are actually dating their computers or their apps and 
all kinds of things to prevent or preclude loneliness and all sorts of other types of social isolation issues. Um, as we sort of project in the future, do we sort of see eventually this kind of nebulous abstract world of thoughts moving to, to actions, moving into habits and moving into belief systems becoming algorithmic? Do you ever see it becoming kind of like the matrix where just like picking the blue pill or the red pill that somehow we're gonna be able to upload and download programs that's gonna teach us these incremental behaviors or potentially even teach us like James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, how to do these 1% actions until we can perfect them into an automaticity. That's kind of like a big roundabout yeah. question to say is, can this one day become algorithmic? Um, I don't wanna be a human battery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it already is. Um, if uh, it, Clubhouse is a remarkable technology that helps people through algorithms find each other and have conversations that leave them feeling less lonely. Right. It's always been a partnership between humans and machines. Whether it's you know thumbs letting us make stone chisels, um, or whether it's algorithms selling us stuff on Instagram or guiding treatment in medicine. You know, we have those algorithms. Is, it, is, is that gonna make Eliza chatbots that we're gonna wanna talk to more than people? Uh, I, I, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I'm not too worried about it um, because it's not like the status quo is good. Yeah, it's going to be a very interesting world and I guess we'll see each other on the other side of the singularity, but. I think it's a, a been a, honestly, this is a topic that has endless appendages and ways to divert. And I hope that we can actually connect again, you know, maybe further down the pandemic and see how the world is transformed at that time. But I think this is a, we're hitting the top of the hour. Um, for those of you who are listening to this, um, we encourage you to uh, use some of the links that we've left in the show notes to connect with Dr. Owen Muir or any of his myriad of, uh, of uh, employees, coaches. If you wanna connect, network, potentially partner, we're gonna be leaving all that information below so that you can speak with him directly. We also encourage you to connect and look at the, up the website, impetusdigital.com. If you were interested in this discussion or the kind of discussions that are similar to this, where you can actually speak with a myriad of stakeholders all at the same time, either synchronously or asynchronously through discussion forums, annotation exercises. You can build position statements, work through issues, um, really push the needle ahead on these sort of beyond the pill conversations. This is exactly what Impetus does along with you know, corporate meetings and everything else using our, our virtual platform. So we encourage you to check that out. Please like or subscribe to this channel so other people can find this, this uh, these uh, really informational sessions as well. And we wanna thank everybody for their time today. Thank you very much, Dr. Owen Muir. This was a real pleasure and wishing everybody a pleasant day ahead.